And before I even go any further, big shout out to Yannick Besson. Um, I almost I was pretty much floored when he when I saw him in that scene. I was like, oh, it's Murdoch. <laughs> He guest starred in this episode as the husband of the dead woman. <laughs> uh, apparently, he had a long string of extramarital affairs, and one woman actually wound up becoming pregnant. She eventually miscarried, but um, he sold all these women this sob story that he couldn't ever be with them while his wife was still alive because they had a prenuptial agreement that said that if he ever cheated he wouldn't get anything. Uh, and in actuality there was no prenuptial agreement. He just didn't want to have any connection with these women. But the woman that was pregnant loved him so much that she decided to get rid of the wife so that they could be together. <laughs> Uh, but unfortunately it was all a bunch of lies. See what she did was she worked in the same uh, office as the victim did. The victim had regular access to uh, perfume samples and makeup samples and stuff like that for the course of the job. And so the woman got into the, the um, room where all the samples were held and she checked one out and apparently it has some, some sort of nicotine in it and she, I don't know how exactly she, I think it was through the makeup or through the perfume, it was absorbed through her skin and she caused her to have a nicotine overdose. She, uh, she got rid of her, but the husband and her together. But that's all small change in comparison to the, the bigger story. Uh, so, by the end of the episode, she realizes that she can't say anything about him. She can't turn him in because, you know, he's saved her life. He was there. He's been protecting her this whole time. He's a good person. And when she goes back to the aunt, she does some research over the past years, and she finds out that uh, he may be connected to at least six or seven other cases. Uh, in the capacity that he was trying to help these people or save them, whatever. Uh, so she realizes then how important that he really is. He tries to make her go away because he knows that since the government knows that she's connected to him and that she knows about him and he's afraid of the government because they already tried to, to kill her once because she had this evidence, you know, that connected him to that crime. And obviously, a la Jason Bourne, they're still trying to find him and kill him because they know he's still alive. He doesn't want her to get hurt, but she's not going to back down, blah, 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 blah. Well, anyway, now that, I've got, now that I've gone through the plot details part of the story, um, how do I say this? Like, Writing-wise, it wasn't bad. I will give them quasi-props for the fact that Ron Coslow is associated with this. And Ron Coslow was the original like, executive producer, director, and creator of the original Feed Me and the Beast, so at least he has some influence on this. So I have to say that that's okay. Uh, the only reason why I was on the fence with this was because, one, the dude really does not look that beastly. He kind of, I mean, the special effects are decent, you know, when he does his shifts. And when he's not, he's still look pretty. This dude can exist on the outside. He can go up into the normal world, and the only thing people would look at him go, wow, look at that scar. He's got a scar on the inside of his face. I don't know where from, but obviously from something. Um, but, uh, other than that, he could exist and come and go freely as he pleases. Although, obviously, the reason why he doesn't is because, uh, because everyone thinks he's dead. So he has to, he's in hiding. And obviously, if anybody knew he was alive, then, you know, the government would try to kill him. I feel like they're trying to mission-ass Beauty and the Beast and, and, and the 
dwarf files <laughs> with with this story. He's not uh, on the caliber of beasts that I was hoping for. I was hoping for something more like Vincent, really. I don't know if was, that was because they didn't want to spend the money on the makeup or because they couldn't find someone as physically imposing as Vince, as Ron Vince, as Ron Perlman was. It's true, it's very hard to find someone that's that physically imposing and you can you know, fit the bill the way that he did. Or have the vocal ability. And also them completely shelving the whole tunnel world thing and just going with, oh, he lives in an abandoned chemical factory type thing. The tunnel world was a major, major part of that show. It was almost like it was almost like that that the show itself was of two worlds. You had what happens on the show in the world above, and you had the second half of the show what happens in the world below. It was like it was two shows in one, and it made it, it had such depth and such emotion and such and you really felt for these families because it wasn't just a bunch of people that lived underground each one of these people had their own story their own past and their own you know they each character was fleshed out and, and rounded and you felt like you knew all of them like they were a family and in this there's none of that they totally show that i idea and it's just him and her I'm sorry, I just, I didn't feel like the connection was there. The connection that Vincent and Catherine had in the original series, I didn't feel it in this. I really, really didn't. I feel like he cares about her. But I think she doesn't know what to think. She knows that he's important. She feels grateful to him for the fact that he saved her life. And I think she feels he's a very, he, he's a, and he, he's an amazing person. But I just don't feel that in instant and immediate like there was between Vincent and Catherine. I don't know, maybe it'll take a couple more episodes for it to really come out, show itself. To, and him. Uh, I don't know what this guy has been in before, and I'm sure he's a decent actor, but in this character, in this, he was more wooden than a corkboard. <laughs> The only time I saw him show any, any real emotion was when he was fighting people and defending her. Even when he was doing the, the beasts of ships, it, I don't know. I'm starting to wonder if if uh, they didn't miscast him. <laughs> But then again, I might be just ever so slightly biased <laughs> in the fact that I'm a fan of the old show. Um, I have a piece of advice for anybody that's watching the new Beauty and the Beast, whether you like it or dislike it, what, whatever. Before you form a completely rounded opinion, uh, go online, uh, go to watchseries.com, TV links. TV-links.eu, whatever website you find that posts episodes, and do yourself a favor. I'm not saying watch all three seasons. Watch a couple episodes of the original show, just to get an idea of the differences, and then form an opinion. Because all you're able to really base an opinion off of right now is on one series. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still trying my best to be neutral on this and reserve judgment. I'm gonna let it, a couple more episodes pan out to see how it goes. Um, 
Uh, Kristen, I know she's a decent actress and she's really good as Lana Lang in Smallville. She, it feels like she's a little, she looks a little young to be a detective. Okay. And she's lucky, she's very, very pretty. So she ages well. <laughs> um, but it's the same thing with her performance. Like, t technically wise, good. Emotionally wise, very wooden. Um, I don't know, I guess we'll just have to wait to see how it ends out. It seemed like the only character that, the only two characters that really uh, were kind of funny and kind of kitschy was her partner and Kessler's roommate. They had some personality, whereas the main characters really don't. <laughs> Very, very little. But I will give it a couple more chances and we'll see how it goes. Um, I've also heard that ABC is developing its own Beauty and the Beast project, but it's going on a more traditional vein, like literally in the Disney vein with Belle and the Beast and the Enchanted Castle and all that. So we'll see how that plays out. Although I really don't think you could have a better Beauty and the Beast story than Ruffles, Ruffles, Skin Bell on Once Upon a Time. But it's just me. Um, yeah, that's about all I have to say for right now. Uh, well, we'll see you guys next week for episode two, and we'll see how it pans out. Hopefully their performances become a little less rigid, and less wooden, more real. And peace out. Talk to you later.